So, on this live, I wanted to talk about uh, the different kinds of pests that can attack plants. I wanted to talk about the signs and symptoms of a lot of pests and what are some common sort of, I guess you could say, tips and tricks for the diagnosing of different pests and pathogens. I want to start off by saying that um, it's sometimes very plant specific. Some pests don't attack more than a few different species of plants. Some are specialists and some are generalists. It's also important to consider the fact that um, different organisms can become pests in certain cases uh, that are very circumstantial. Um, and that this sort of a list is uh, non-exhaustive. There will always be new pests, there will always be new pathogens, there will always be new problems to deal with in agriculture, in horticulture, in anything. So, for starters, there are probably two main camps of for arthropod pests. Um, you've got pests that use a stylet, sort of like a proboscis from like a mosquito, a stylet. Um, so that's a sucking mouth part. And then you've got the chewing mouth parts of like caterpillars, leaf beetles, um, grasshoppers. Those are like the two main mouth parts that you're going to deal with for like arthropod pests. And it's pretty easy to tell what those are because uh, chewing mouth parts have mechanical damage, right? They are damaging your leaves, your stems, your flowers, um, your roots, possibly, by ch chewing them, by having mouth parts that uh, mangle and maim and cut off uh, parts of the plant tissue and then ingests it. So if you see holes in your plants, um, if you see what's called leaf skeletonizing, so that's when you um, you can see the leaf and you can see like the veins, but all of the like chlorophyll has been kind of eaten out, then that's skeletonization, and that's caused by a chewing mouth part. Um, you can have leaf mines, which are little tunnels inside the leaves that a little um, a larva was inside of. So that can be um, a fly, that could be a moth, larva, there's many different kinds. Um, and they usually will either pupate inside of the leaf or they'll, or they'll come out of the leaf and then pupate on the leaf or uh, somewhere else. So those are pretty simple, those are pretty easy to, to see. Um, caterpillars, for example, are uh, Lepidopterus larvae. So moths and butterflies, and we've all seen this, they chew on the leaf, they chew on the exterior, uh, and maybe sometimes the interior, but not usually. You've got leaf beetles, chrysomelids, and uh, they skeletonize, or they chew holes into leaves from the center, um, or from the outside, just depends. So those are all chewing mouth parts, those are all examples of chewing mouth part organisms. Um, it's really important to not confuse the two because if you confuse the two at the very beginning um, of your diagnosis when you're crop scouting or you're just looking at your plants, then you fundamentally have misidentified what could possibly be the case. So if you can start with that correctly, you can have that work out for your benefit. Then the other aspect that you have, the other of the two main groups, is the sucking mouth parts. And those don't really have the same kind of obvious physical um, abnormality associated with the plant. But they can have other abnormalities too. They might be able to um, transfer a virus or another pathogen. So it's not really damage of the stylet, right? It's damage of... Uh, it's indirect damage, or it's associated damage, right? So you've got sucking mouth parts and chewing mouth cards, parts. And sucking mouth parts don't really leave very much damage at all. Um, you know, if you see, like, small little punctures in your plant, it's probably not, it's not going to be your uh, leaf hopper. It's not going to be your aphid, you know. Things that have sucking mouth parts include things like aphids, leaf hoppers, plant hoppers, um... Spider mites feed in this way as well. They don't have little mandibles. They have stylets. Um, 
but uh, other mites do. Other mites don't use a stylus as much. They have like mandibular um, uh, movements that they make, and they crush and they mangle tissue. Um, thrips, for example, are a chewing mouth part, but they kind of like chew. Uh, they kind of like scrape the leaves, and then they kind of like suck up the plant juice. It's actually kind of um, it's actually kind of interesting because their mandibles are actually um, uh, they're not they're not uh, uh, symmetrical. Uh, one is going to be bigger than the other, and they kind of like scrape, and that's how you get that like stippling effect. But anyways, so indirectly, or um, rather, uh, so plant sucking mouth parts, juice juice sucking mouth parts, phloem is what they're feeding on, and a lot of those organisms are hemipterans, and some of them are spider mites. So they're acarids, they're tetranychids, right? Um, and a lot of hemipterans, your stink bugs, your aphids, your leaf hoppers, they suck up the white flies, for example. They suck up the plant juices, and then they require a symbiotic relationship mm-hmm. with some sort of organism, a bacteria possibly, um, well, usually bacteria, in their bacteriomes, which are organs that are specifically designed to process the food that they're feeding on. If they didn't have those they would not be successful at feeding on the plant. So those are incredibly important for them. Um, and, uh, yeah, so you have, so those are the two big, those are the two big, like, damaged profiles that you're going to come across. So if you come across a bunch of, like, leaf damage that seems to be mechanical in nature, then you have to ask yourself, well, what bugs have I been seeing? What are the possibilities? Does it look more like one kind or another? Is it a caterpillar? Caterpillars tend to eat on the edges, um, but not always. It depends on the plant and depends on the species. Um, is it feeding on, is it skeletonizing? Are there tunnels? Is it a leaf miner? These are all questions that you have to ask yourself. And the specific kind of damage that you're dealing with is going to um, avail itself to you. And it's going to give you a, a, um, clues as to what you're dealing with, right? But then you might have some some sorts of damage that look similar to others, right? So you've got caterpillars that eat on the edges of the leaves, or you've got grasshoppers that eat on the edges of the leaves. And the only way you'll know the difference, possibly, is if you recognize how big the uh, the bite marks are. That could be possible, although you run into a problem there, because is it just a, is it a small caterpillar? Or is it a big caterpillar? Is it a is it a big caterpillar or is it a regular sized grasshopper feeding? You won't know until you see that happen. Um, and then of course with the phloem feeders, you don't really have that sort of situation. You're not going to be seeing the like they don't leave like mosquito bites. Although some of them do gall the plant, most of them don't. Um, I mean, most is sort of a relative term. A lot of them don't. Uh, so so that's a really important aspect of of uh, crop scouting is being able to see the signs of um of your of your pests of your pathogens um with regards to pathogens a lot of the time you have pretty specific um symptoms right sometimes you have no super specific symptoms right sometimes it's the same symptom no matter what the plant is if it's a generalist pathogen or a specific pathogen viruses can sometimes have very specific, um, like modeling, or they can have very specific, like, uh, uh, symptoms where the plant will start to wilt or it will discolor in a specific way. Um, a lot of viruses are named after either the first plant they were isolated on or something similar to that and an additional, um, like symptom that they cause possibly, probably in that particular plant that they're, um, referenced in. But that doesn't mean that, and this is really important, that doesn't mean that they only infect that plant. Most viruses infect a bunch of different kinds of plants, if they infect plants. Some viruses, they can infect plants and animals. And that's, you know, pretty, pretty. I guess you could say it's impressive, but it's also kind of scary, right? Uh, if you're one of the animals that it infects. Um, bacteria, fungi... You know, depending on exactly what you're dealing with, you could have, like, violet spotting on the leaves. You could have um, 
you know, you could have a situation where the uh, yeast that you're dealing with, perhaps, is um, f literally fermenting your plant from the inside out, right? That's a that's pretty obvious. If you start getting, to get root rot or crown rot or something like that, it's a pretty obvious sign, and um, you know the prognosis is not so good because if you can just if it destroys the entire root system, you're obviously gone. And if you're in that sort of situation, you should have you have to ask you have to act quick because if you don't, you're going to lose your other plants probably pretty quickly because whatever got that disease into your first plant or your first few plants is probably vectoring it. So now I want to talk about like vectoring with regards to pathogens in specific. So you've got pretty common um, pathogens like Fusarium, um, Phythoptera, uh, Verticillium, Verticillium, yeah, uh, and that kind of stuff. Those are pretty common generalists. You've got erysipheles, you've got powdery mildew, right? And uh, some organisms can be vectored. Some of these pathogens can be vectored. And that's, uh, that's something that a lot of people don't either recognize or they don't consider. And I think it's a really important aspect of integrated pest management and uh, effective prevention of disease. Because some people might not make the uh, connection between a big fungus gnat population, for example, and a, um, a, fusarium, a fusarium outbreak. And if you are dealing with both, you better believe that the fungus gnats, the adults, can and will come into contact with um, spores or infected material, or they'll lay their eggs in it, and the larvae will develop in it and pupate, and then they will a close out of their uh, puparia, and then they will have the spores all over all over them, not because they were on them when they were inside the puparia, but because they're going to walk around where they just were, and that's where the spores will be, if it's a, like a fungus, for example, like Fusarium. Um, and, or, or, yeah. And it, oh, so, like, Pythium, I want to talk about this, too. So, as a small detour, before I start talking about vectoring, um, there's, there are fungi and then there are oomycetes and fungi are, you know, they're, they're fungus. They're, they're, uh, fungal organisms. See, they're basidiomycetes that have real, like, mushrooms. And then there's ascomycetes that have, like, sacs that are kind of, like, analogous to a mushroom, but not really. They're not really the same thing. And, you know, basidiomycetes can be huge. We eat them all the time if you like mushrooms. Um... If you don't, I mean, nobody eats ascomycetes. They're way too small. They're really microscopic. And I think they're also more ancient. I might be wrong there. But I think they're also an older kind of organism as a lineage. Uh, but um, those are fungi. Oomycetes are not fungi. They are kind of like a... You can think of them as like a hybrid group. Up until pretty recently, we thought that they were fungi. But oomycetes, they have like a like a special like zoo spore, so it, it's it's a flagellate spore. So most spores are passive; they don't have any way of moving on their own. They're kind of um, uh, they're they're at the mercy of like wind or soil particles or like something picking them up while they're moving. Um, that's a spore. But uh, a zoo spore has a little flagellum, little little moving uh, like arm or appendage, and it's able to move in the water. And if it's and if there's soil and you water, or the rain, or the rain happens, um, the uh, the wet soil it can move right through it. It's able to like like it's able to move uh, pretty competently, and it can move with chemotaxi, where it can um, it can uh, detect little signs and symptoms of plants, and then it will move towards those plants and infect them, right? So that's like Pythium. Pythium are oomycetes. They're not fungi. And that's really important because although some fungicides work on oomycetes, they are not the same thing, and they shouldn't be confused. And you might think, well, why does it really matter um, if the fungicide works or if I treat it like a fungus, if it's basically like a fungus? Well, sure, but you're also going to deny yourself the advantage of knowing its advantages, which puts you at a disadvantage. If you don't know 
that um, it can move through water, if you don't know that it's not passive, um, and if you don't know other physiological aspects about it, you are at a disadvantage when dealing with it, and any sort of cleverness you might have uh, may be shut down because you thought it was more like a fungus, and it wasn't. You thought it would be static, but it's mobile, that kind of a thing. And that actually extends to most pests and pathogens. Uh, understanding, like, for example, that the uh, hemipterans have bacteriomes can be helpful, you know, because maybe a product comes out that's like an antibiotic, maybe like a systemic antibiotic, for example, and then that antibiotic doesn't affect, the. It, maybe it's a specific one, or it's a general one, you know, like with uh, the Asian citrus psyllid. Uh, if you don't know, the Asian citrus psyllid has... Um, a, bacter a, a bacterium, a phytoplasma inside it that it vectors called Huanglongbing or citrus greening disease. Um, and it's hard to, cult it's hard to uh, culture it uh, in the lab. It's really hard to study. But the problem is that if the organism is vectored by this insect, then uh, controlling the insect is important. But if it feeds even once... Um, it can infect that uh, citrus plant with the with the phytoplasma, which is a special kind of bacteria. And if you don't, so like for example, if you know that it's a bacteria and you use an antibacterial antibiotic and it's able to be taken up by the plant, then that plant can then so that bacteria might be able to be killed in the same way that a human would take an antibiotic that's an antibacterial and. Um, and, and, and kill that bacterium, or that bac that colony of bacteria that's affecting you. It's the same sort of thing, um, but our physiologies are very different, so you have to go about it differently. But um, So that's what I'm trying to say, is that understanding the physiology of your pests and pathogens is kind of important. Understanding their life history is important, right? But going back to vectoring, a lot of organisms, a lot of microarthropods and macroarthropods, to be honest... Uh, they are vectors for different pathogens. A lot of hemipterans are uh, vectors for pathogens. And sometimes they're vectors because the, you know they fed on a plant somewhere else that has the... Uh, it's like malaria. It's a pretty good metaphor for mal with malaria and mosquitoes and humans. A mosquito uh, takes up the malarial um, pathogen into itself and then it will, then the pathogen uh, travels down during the, um, uh, the, during the feeding of the human, or on whatever animal it is, but like for humans, we get infected with malaria. So, because it kind of excretes um, the mosquito, sorry, the mosquito excretes a, uh, or secretes like a, um, like a, how would you put it, like an anti-inflammatory, um, uh, in their saliva, and so that's when the pathogen gets into the into the person, and that's um, that's how that happens. That's how that transference happens. The the um, the vectoring, and with aphids, it's the same kind of thing. They dip their silate into the plant cell. They go to suck up phloem, but at the same time, there's a secre there are secretions that are secreted during the feeding. So it's a two way street, at least at the beginning in some cases. And a virus or a bacteria can go into the plant, and that's how that happens. So, you know, your plant can be super healthy. It can be well defended. It can have um, cutin and uh, you know the waxy coating over the leaves and the and the stem. It can have all of the uh, physical defenses that you want. That's normal. But if the stylet pierces the plant, then it's game over. If you're trying to get if you're trying to keep from a virus happening. If you're trying to keep your plant from getting any of the myriad viruses that exist, you will um, succumb to them if the pest is able to reach your plant. And that pest is a, is a carrier, is a vector. Um, some, so like, you even have some organisms that can, uh, how do I put it? Well, I won't get into that for this video. But anyways, that's that's a subject that I really wanted to talk about. Um, how plants and how how plants are affected by different pests, and how you can look for those symptoms and signs. I really wish that I had some sort of like uh, 
um, like a paper or like a diagram that I could be showing you. I do have videos on YouTube that kind of go over some of these subjects, but you know, not in soup, not in a lot of detail, and sometimes they're very specific. If you're interested, you can check them out. My YouTube channel is called Xenthanol. That's Z-E-N-T-H-A-N-O-L. I know a lot of people ask, how do you spell it? So I'm going to spell it there. But um, it's definitely not... None of the videos are as detailed as I'd like to be as a, in general, sort of, as like a general primer for like vectoring and that kind of a thing. But um, if you're the sort of person who's interested in like how microbes and arthropod pests and pathogens all kind of like coalesce and, and um, interact with each other with the plant host, it's actually a really, really interesting thing. A lot of people don't know this, but... Um, so let's put it this way. You've got a, you've got a, a sliding scale. You've got a spectrum. And on that spectrum, you've got on one side, you've got pathogens. And on the other side, you've got a uh, symbiont, let's say, sim a symbiotic organism, right? And if you, uh, if you have a pathogen that interacts with an organism over a long period of time, over time, that pathogen may become, instead of being um, parasitic, it may become uh, commensalic or mutualistic. And I know that's a hard, that's kind of an interesting sort of thing, don't you think? That like a pathogen can sort of evolve over time, co-evolve with its host to become a benefit instead of a detriment. The opposite happens too. Um, you could have a, you could have a, a, a symbiont that over time becomes a little bit less mutualistic and then a little bit less. You know, you might have one population of insects that have this symbiont and maybe over time that population of symbionts in that population of insects changes. Maybe because of outside conditions, maybe because um, something about the food that they're, that the insects are consuming, maybe there's a chemical in there that changes how the symbiont expresses a gene. All, or, or it could just be random mutation. Like, all of these factors can happen. And you can have a symbiont go from being a benefit to a detriment. But, like, not over the span of a few years. This is over the span of, like, millions of years. Or hundreds of thousands of years sometimes. Because insects, they reproduce pretty fast. Um... So, so it's a really cool, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a really complex relationship that plants and, and, uh, insects and arthropods have. Um, I'm really just talking about, I guess, cool things to do with pests and pathogens and, and how it's really important. I guess the main theme of this live, when I think about it now, is, is not so much the, uh, insects and, uh, and their, their feeding types. And their, and their signs, not just pests and pathogens. But also, once you go further than that, what, what does that mean for you? Once you have that problem of damage, how do you diagnose it? And what are the, what are the possibilities that, you know, that you got, that you got infected with something, um, that you have, uh, something that vectors either through feeding or just physical contact with the plant. You know, you can't really control that. If that organism is coming out from, you know, the air, uh, or the organism is coming from somebody else's grow, their situation, uh, you might be doing everything right, but their situation may not be like this. And all it takes is for one fusarium-laden fungus gnat to bounce over to your cultivation space, lay some eggs, if it finds it suitable, to do so. And then, you know, contact, uh, maybe, maybe there's a little place where somebody has nicked the plant and the fungus gnat walks right over it and transfers a few spores. Boom. That's it. Maybe some pythium. Boom. It's in the phloem. And at that point it's infected. Sure. There's an immune response. I don't want to act like plants don't have an immune response and that plants don't have, um, a veritable selection of physiological weaponry. But what makes a pest a pest, like I've said before, is its ability to overmatch and overcome the physiology of the, uh, the plant, the host.
Otherwise, it wouldn't be a very good pest, right? <laughs> if the pest was not very good at doing this, then we wouldn't really see them very often, or we'd only see them in specific cases. Um, yeah, so I guess, I guess that's kind of what I wanted to talk about, for the most part. Um, I really wish that I had a diagram and something to, like, articulate with while I'm here, but... Yeah, I... I suppose there is one other topic. I could talk about how, um... So, everyone here has probably heard of uh, beneficial microbes, beneficial fungi, beneficial bacteria, things like that. And, uh, I've heard people talk about fungal dominant and bacterial dominant, um, soils and things like this, and, um, I am not, I'm not a microbiologist, right? But, um, even a, even a microbiologist has to, has to understand and, and, uh, bear truth to the fact that there are so many microbes, so many populations, so many isolates, there's, um, and I'm not talking about, like, things that we produce commercially. I'm, when I say isolate, I just mean, like, an isolated population. I mean a, a population that is uh, unique in some way. And there's a ton of that, just like there's many different kinds of people in different cultures, different cultures, whether they're bacterial culture or human culture, right? Different groups of people who share those sort of unique traits, whether they're memes or genes, right? And... Um, for example, there are fusarial, you might find this sort of hard to believe, but there are fusarial um, isolates that have been discovered, that have been identified, that are not pathogenic. And that supports what I was saying before. You've got uh, parasitic organisms, you've got parasitic fusarium that exist. Most people know them as pests, but there are certain isolates that are not actually pathogenic. Or rather, if I'm being truthful, they're, or at least rather if I'm being pedantic, they are not pathogenic to certain plants in certain cases. But we can't test them for all possibilities because that would just not be possible, not feasible for humans to do. But you'll find that the, maybe a, a fusarial population, for whatever reason, maybe it lacks a gene that'll, that allows it to um, enter into the plant. For example, powdery mildew. Uh, powdery mildew, if you don't know, the way that it infects a plant is that a spore lands on the surface of a leaf. So it lands on this leaf and it adheres to the leaf. And then it creates what's called an appressorium. And the appressorium is like a little, a little arm and it travels along the cell, the, le the, the, the surface of the leaf, which has obviously cells, and then a waxy layer on top. And so the appressorium moves, and then it creates what's called a penetration peg, and then that penetration peg moves down, and there are enzymes, cutinase, pectinase, and cellulase that go through pectin, uh, uh, or cutin, pectin, and cellulose, right? So it dissolves, it drills down into the cell, and then it creates something called a hostorium, or multiple hostoria in different cells. And what these are, basically, you could think of it as like a food node. This is where um, the exchange of food happens for the plant, for the fungus, for the powdery mildew. So this hostorium is where nutrient exchange happens. And that's why um, pathogens can be like this. They're, they're called obligate parasites. They're parasitic. They're biotrophs. Biotrophs are organisms that sort of, um, they work with the plant. Necrotrophs don't. Necrotrophs kill the tissue and then feed on it. And then they continue to kill the tissue. Biotrophs are more, they don't really do that. And then you have things that are like, that are both biotrophic and necrotrophic. They're biotrophic up to a point and then they're necrotrophic after that. But for powdery mildew, um, they just kind of parasitize the cells on the surface. They don't go any further than that. And then they feed, and then they take in the nutrients, and they're, they're parasitic. And then they, they create hyphae, right? And then they create conidia, and those conidia have um, spores, and then the spores, you know, that's the powder that you're seeing. 
on the surface of a plant. That's why it's called powdery mildew. So, um, if you, uh, so, so that's how that happens. So if you have an organism that, um, well, how do I put, so powdery mildew has these genes that allow it, that express, and it uses those expressions, or it expresses enzymes, I should say, that allow it to dissolve into the plant. If it didn't have that, it would die. It wouldn't have any way to parasitize the plant. But maybe it would have, maybe the genes change. Or maybe something about the genes um, makes it so that it's not nearly as productive. Or it's not nearly as parasitic as it could be. Or maybe something about um, the nutrient, uh, I guess you could say the nutrient exchange happens where it also um, kind of, uh, I guess you could say it dislodges or maybe it diffuses other chemicals into the cell, maybe hormones, maybe, um, or, or chemicals that act like hormones, which I guess would still make them hormones for the plant, uh, effectively, or maybe they're, um, elemental nutrients or something like that, like mycorrhizae do, and that's how you have, that's how you have, like, a mildew or an organism go from being a parasite to being a symbiont. That's just one example. So, the uh, powdery mildew, um, the spore creates the oppressorium, penetration peg drills into the cell, creates the hostorium, and then there's a nutrient exchange. But if it doesn't have that, uh, those genes that make it virulent, then it doesn't have, uh, then it's not nearly as parasitic and not nearly as problematic. And then if over time other genetic changes happen that makes it, like who knows, like maybe I could imagine a situation where powdery mildew or, or, you know, for example, if I was, if I was uh, imagining evolutionary future, you could have a parasite like powdery mildew um, maybe create a symbiotic relationship with a plant whereby it covers the plant in the same way that, like, mycorrhizae, co certain mycorrhizae, ectomycorrhizae, um, cover uh, the root system in a hartig net. If you don't know what a hartig net is, it's... Um, it's like a, think of it as like a web of hyphae, of plant, of a fungal hyphae that layer the root system. And this protects it physically from like heavy metals. It protects it from, um, it's, it's like a second skin that's like a defensive barrier. It also um, helps out with the collection of nutrients. If you don't know, rootlets are really important for nutrient exchange. That's where the nutrient exchange actually happens. So the fungal hyphae become an extension of that root system, an extension of those rootlets that are even more fine and able to take up more water, able to take up more nutrients, and then there's an exchange between the fungus and the plant where nutrients are exchanged and everyone's happy. So with powdery mildew, it's kind of, you could imagine a situation where the, um, where the, population maybe covers the plant and maybe it denies other pests from eating it. Maybe it produces a toxin on the surface of the leaves. Obviously the leaves would have to photosynthesize and maybe the trade-off is that the plant photosynthesizes less but the um, uh, but maybe the um, plant is also defended better from like uh, a a caterpillar who would come along and try to eat the the leaf tissue. Well, it can't because it's got this fungal sheath on the leaves. So that doesn't exist as far as I know. But what I do know is that powdery mildew does deny certain organisms from feeding where it is. And that makes sense. If you've got like a, you know, you don't want to eat powdery mildew covered lettuce and neither do pests. And Probably for for somewhat different reasons, honestly, it could be that certain organisms um, could feed it, feed on it and be okay. Other ones might die on the spot because of the mycotoxins that uh, a powdery mildew or aspergillus mold would create. Like that's why we don't eat moldy bread because of the mycotoxins that aspergillus creates. If it didn't create those mycotoxins, it probably wouldn't be so bad. But because it does, and those are highly highly dangerous you had that problem. Um, 
So, so yeah, so the, the world, the physiology of pests and diseases are, is vast, and the possibilities for change is also vast. Uh, whether that happens through, um, through like breeding, so sort of like breeding your plants to be more resistant, or breeding your plants to be, I don't know, more receptive to certain biologicals, for example. Um, you could also have, yeah, so like mycorrhizae, so, um, or, or different endophytes, for example. You could have microbes that will enter into the plant and not be pathogenic, but they might um, assist the plant. They might be entomopathogenic. So they'll go into the plant, they'll travel up the plant or down the plant somewhat, and um, they'll, inf they'll infect the tissues. They'll, they'll become part of the tissues inside of them anyways. And then, a, you know, an organism will come in like an aphid, maybe, and it'll stick its little stylet into the tissue, and then it will suck up this entomopathogenic fungus, uh, and then it will die, because uh, you basically just took the bomb into the, <laughs> into the ship, and now it's going to blow up. You know, the, the, the fungus would normally have to work four times as hard to penetrate the cuticle of the organism, spread out into the into the uh, body, and feed on the hemocele in the plant in the uh, in the pest. But if the organism like sucks it up and puts it in its stomach, then that's going to be perfect. There's no uh, defenses there necessarily. A lot of a lot of pests don't have a really great immune system. Um, well. I take that back. A lot of them do, but some of them don't, or some of them don't have a good immune system for certain organisms, right? Just like us, right? Things that don't affect us, sometimes they don't because they're just not compatible, and sometimes they don't because they're just not very good pathogens, or they're just not, maybe they're not adapted to us, or something like that. Maybe they can kind of feed on us, but not really, because our classification of pathogens and pests is not, it's, it's a, it's a collection, it's a classification of us putting order on chaos. If I'm going to be a little bit philosophical here, it's, um, there's plenty of organisms out there that kind of deny our really simplified, um, hierarchy for classification. And, um, sometimes they just buck the rules, like, you might have an organism that's in a group of, of like insects or whatever, and maybe they're all part of this group because they have certain characteristics. Well, this one species is definitely genetically related. However, it has a totally different, um, has a totally different like maybe mouth part or maybe something very integral about the organism has changed, and like there's no explanation. We're not going to put it somewhere else because genetically it's related, but it just doesn't have that characteristic that, that we would normally associate with. And that's just how it is. Pathogens are like that. Uh, beneficial organisms are like that. Every All life is like that. That's why, like, the difference between, like, um, a shrub and a tree, right? Like, you know, at some point that shrub might become more like a tree, especially if you, like, prune it in a certain way. Right? It's like, what's the difference between, you know, this is sort of very baseline philosophical, but it's kind of like, what's, you have a sand granule, and you have a pile of sand. At one point, does a granule, a collection of granules of sand become a pile? What's the difference between a pond and a lake? Right? You know, it's kind of like, you know, town versus city. There's some, de there's definitions to that, but like, you know, there's some leeway as well. And you always have to have that when you're considering life and what's possible because there are hard and fast rules, yes. And that's served us very well. But there's also evolution and there's also um, other aspects of physiology and, and new species and, and all kinds of things. Um, right now we're dealing with something I've talked about many times before. Uh, we're dealing with the... Um, what's it called? The plant hopper. The um, in Pennsylvania, uh, I'm 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 screwing up on its name. 
but there's a uh, there's a plant hopper in Pennsylvania right now that's native to Southeast Asia, and it's it's in Pennsylvania and it's destroy it's like it's everywhere, and it it just took one, it just took one like bushel of bad produce to go from, you know, Vietnam or southern China or wherever it came from, wherever that was to the United States, and customs didn't catch it, the USDA didn't catch it, and now we have this problem, and so now we're going to find out, hey, does this pest reproduce? Well, apparently it does, and it feeds on hops, and it feeds on grapes, and it feeds on maybe cannabis, and it maybe feeds on uh, many other woody plants, maybe roses, maybe different kinds of trees. Maybe some populations have... um, Maybe they have a pathogen that we don't know. Maybe a vector is something. Maybe it can be a vector for something. We don't know. And you and you know, like it's not the kind of thing. It's not the kind of thing you want to know, and it's not the kind of thing you can necessarily like predict because you're not going to be able to look at every single organism and and test whether it's a vector or not. You know, there's literally thousands of um, plant hoppers and leaf hoppers that that they could have tested to see if it's a vector for a virus, but that would be an enormous undertaking. Um, But now that we have the pest in the United States, we have to find out, well, how do we eradicate it? And hopefully not before we find out something really terrible and deleterious, like, oh, by the way, it can also vector citrus greening disease. That would be bad. That would be incredibly bad. Or maybe it can it can vector one of the many kinds of viruses that affect cucumber or uh, all the Solanaceae, potatoes and peppers and um, and all of that. And so then you have to contend with the fact that um, this new pest is now an even greater threat, not because of its feeding, not because it's particularly destructive on its own, but because it vectors this pest or this virus. And maybe it's the very first time in history that that organism has made contact with a plant that has that virus. It's not consciously thinking about this. It just is what it is. And that's the really scary stuff is that we just don't know. And I would never want to be in that situation where you just don't know. And you now have to contend with a new pest. So that's another thing you have to consider. As much as I like to talk about prevention and curative um, controls and how it's really important to be preventative, um, prevention works all the way up until it doesn't because maybe somebody else doesn't control their pests and now they're in your property or because somebody decided that they really wanted that um, bamboo or they really wanted that plant from some other country and they decided to smuggle it across the uh, border. You know, and now now you have a problem, and now everyone else in the tri-state area has the problem, and um, now the government has to come in and 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 figure out well, is this going to be an agricultural epidemic or not? So um, prevention, curative controls, those are all those are basically two halves of the same coin uh, for IPM and control strategy. You have to have both, and you have to have to consider both. But then there's just the unknown, and you won't have a preventative measure for the unknown, necessarily. You might, and you might not have a curative methodology um, at the beginning for a new pest. You might be able to take uh, strategies from other places that have that pest, but until you deal with it yourself, you're really flying blind. And then there's what I was just talking about. There's also the possibility that the uh, pests are disease pathogen might, um, well, the pest might be able to vector a pathogen, or the pathogen might be um, incredibly infectious to a particular crop that was never, you know, associated with before. We're finding new pathogens and new hosts every single year. Well, probably more than that, but the published data comes out every year, and you, f- you find, you know, first example of Fusarium moxisporum on, you know, whatever, wild tomato. Or, um, yeah, I'm probably on wild tomato, but like something like this, where you have the first report of X pathogen in X country on X crop, you know, and even in 2018, where we've been, when we've been growing these plants for 
literally centuries, uh, oftentimes millennia, right? And we still, you know, obviously, like, published research and stuff, that, like we think of now, hasn't been around for millennia. But their analogs have, and that sort of information is really crucial because even some information, like information from 1975 or 1943, like those, that information oftentimes still holds weight, but it's just not very detailed. Sometimes it's uh, erroneous. Uh, sometimes it's not. You just have to consider that, you know, the pests and pathogens probably didn't change all that much uh, in the span of like a century when you consider their entire lifespan and their entire existence um, on earth but what you do run into a problem with with old information if you know I would be remiss if I didn't mention this you do have a problem where the um, the protocols for the research might not have been correct and, they, and nobody knew this until like we did more information we did more research and find this sort of thing out but some things like uh like resistance genes in um, in plants, or rather um, susceptibility genes also in plants. You know, we've known about these things for like 70 years. You know, we've known about genes and things like that for quite a long time. And uh, our, uh, our repertoire of genetic knowledge and pathogenic information just continues to increase at an alarming rate. Despite the fact that government agencies and private entities are not really supporting it. I mean, there's millions of dollars that goes into ag. I don't want to paint a, 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 a mi misrepresentative picture, but it is true. We, do, we have defunded a lot of the USDA and, this, and the CDFA. Um, well, for example, because I'm in California. But um, uh, in, in other countries, this has happened as well. But way less so. I, I'm in the United States, obviously, so I have a very specific uh, outlook for my government entity that has to work about this kinds of thing, uh, this sort of thing. And if you're going to, um, if you're really worried about whether we're going to have citrus in the next 50 years or not, then I would think you'd be putting a lot of money into this sort of thing. But like a lot of human catastrophe, it feels like we have to reach a breaking point first before any of that can happen. And if that's true, we're probably going to lose quite a bit before we gain some. Unless it's, you know, uh, a financial incentive for somebody to be very clever. And then that kind of thing happens. But I, I try not to I try not to advocate for that because you don't really want to get yourself into that position in the first place. You want to be preventative. You want to have customs. You want to have... Uh, border security for produce coming in and that kind of a thing. Anyways, I think that's where I'm going to sign off. Um, I might make another one of these uh, either later today or possibly even, um, I mean, definitely later in the week. But uh, maybe even another one today, who knows. But if you have any questions, if you enjoyed this, um, uh, find my YouTube channel. I'm going to make it, I'm going to load this video onto my YouTube channel, and I'm going to have more videos regarding this sort of subject matter, which was kind of, if, I, if I'm being honest, I, I was a little rambly, I'm sorry about that, but uh, hopefully you liked that, and um, I'll see you then. So I decided that instead of just whining about not having the proper resources to show and uh, diagram out what I was trying to talk about, I would just get a little piece of paper and a pen. I just write. So, I was describing before how erysipheles or powdery mildews, um, how they infect plants, right? So, the first way, or well, the only way, there's no first way. Um, first thing I'm going to do is draw the cell. So, a, a, a plant cell obviously is very different than a uh, an animal cell, right? Actually, I'm going to make it a little bit more obvious about that, right there. You know, they're blocky. They're not like animal cells that are more, they're less rigid, right, because of the cellulose. Anyways, so you got your plant cell. And then you have a spore, an air airborne spore. A lot of pests, not just fungi uh, and bacteria and all that, a lot of pests, 
areophyte mites like russet mites, broad mites, um, thrips, uh, spider mites, a ton of pests. Um, they get by through air currents. And a lot of times they have, some of them fly because they have wings, but they're not like great, like thrips aren't great flyers. You know, they're very small, they get swept up by the wing, by the wind, um, and really they don't affect, and obviously like russet mice have no wings and they're very small, and so they're able to get caught up in, um, in the, in the air current and they get up into the jet stream, um, and they become what's called aeroplankton. But spores also do. Spores are, are kind of the archetypical example of a pathogen that moves through the air currents. So, a spore lands on the, uh, the plant cell. And then, um, then it creates something called an apressorium, an apressorium. And all that really is, is a little, it's a little, uh, it's a little hyphal strand, kind of. You could think of it that way, right? So you've got this little spore and it's a little apressorium, and you've got the plant cell that's on and attached to and glued to. And then it creates something called a penetration plug. And a penetration plug allows, it's is that at that site, that is where the three major enzymes, cutinase, uh, pectin, cellulase, and pectinase, are produced, and those dissolve away cutin, pectin, and cellulose, which are structural, um, you know, they're structural molecular bonds of the plant cell. So you're literally drilling through to get to the good stuff, to get to the nutrients, the cytoplasm in the, in the, in the middle. In fact, let me draw that before I get any further f through this, right? Because you got the cell wall and you got the cytoplasm, right? The gooey innards that they want to eat or parasitize. So the penetration peg goes through the cutin and the pectin and the cellulose. And then it develops something that we call a hostorium. And a hostorium is like a, is a node. It is a nexus, a site through which nutrients are taken up by the parasite, by the powdery mildew. So I'm just going to draw that really basically. And uh, that's the site of nutrient transfer into the plant. So it kind of looks like this. It is in the is in the um, the cytoplasm, and that's where the nutrient exchange happens. So then, after that happens, after it starts sucking up all those nutrients, it'll start to produce other fungal structures that you might have heard of before, called hyphae uh, strands of its body. You know, and so it'll just produce that and then more of that, and then over time, pretty quickly, it'll start to produce um, conidia. Conidia are the uh, reproductive structures of many ascomycetes, um, but in this case, powdery mildew. And uh, conidia will create the asexual spores. Now, there are sexual spores, uh, Clisothecia or, or A. Clisothecium, but those are way more rare, and those are actually there's those mostly happen for overwintering. Now, I mean, they also often don't happen um, for other reasons. Uh, but a lot of organisms, a lot of fungi don't, a lot of powdery mildews don't make Clisothecium, Clisothecia, but they can. And it depends on the conditions that they're under, and certain populations are going to do it more commonly than others. But anyways, conidia are these asexual structures. Well, they're the structures that bear the spores, to be specific. So you've got this. This is sort of an artist rendering. It's definitely not um, super technical, hopefully. But you know, you've got the hyphae. I'm going to put that here, the hostorium. Right, and you get the spore, then you've got the conidia, and then you've got the spores again. Yeah. Right, so that makes sense. Hopefully that's not too hard to 
hard to articulate, right? So, oh, it's it's mirrored, right? But right, so you've got the uh, the spore here produces an apressorium that creates the hostorium, and then the hyphae pr are produced after that once it successfully gains nutrients that way, just like a seed, right, in the soil. Same kind of thing. It's just the uh, nutrients have already been taken by another organism. No problem for the powdery mildew. Um, and then it produces the conidia, and then it creates the spores. And that's the, that's the powder that you're seeing, is the, everything on the surface. Powdery mildew is an epiphyte. Epiphytes exist on the surface of a plant, a phyte, a phyto, you know, a plant. And epa means at the surface. Uh, some people believe or are not sure of whether or not uh, powdery mildew is systemic, or rather, what's probably better to say is um, systemically infectious, because there is a slight pedantic difference between the two. Um, and the answer is no. Powdery mildew is not systemic. It's not systemically infectious, anyways. Um, that's not how it infects plants. There's no example of that anywhere in the plant, in the fungal, in the ascomycete, in the aerosyphilid uh, family. There are no powdery mildews that do that. That would, be the, that would be new to science if that was discovered to be the case. Now, it is, also, it is, however, true, and the reason why I say systemically infectious is because you can definitely have situations where little pieces of molecules or... Um, little hyphal strands or tissues can get into the uh, into the plant and they can be detected in the phloem. Kind of like how if you take a blood test, um, you somebody might be able to detect like uh, whether or not, well, okay, so there's certain diseases for humans, for example, where, you know, you might have like a, I guess you could say you have like a tumor somewhere in your body, or you can have this site of infection. And maybe if it was systemically infectious, what would happen is that, like, let's say I had something in my head, it would travel through maybe my circulatory system. And then uh, if you took a blood sample, you might be able to go, oh, you know, these are, these are like little bits of cancer. Or, oh, these are little bits of the, the pathogen. And if it was not systemically infectious, you could still find those things, but they don't, they don't break off and become new sites of infection. If it is, then that's exactly what happens. If it's not, then it doesn't, but it is still a symptom and still a sign. So you can still use it for diagnosis in that way, um, although powdery mildew already has its own signs and symptoms, which are a bunch of powder that's white on the surface of your plant. But no, it's not systemically infectious. I know that's a, a pretty common misconception for a lot of people, and I just wanted to clear that up as well. They don't the the organism proper doesn't really doesn't go past the uh, really the surface of the plant only to infect the surface level uh, cells. So that's kind of the only reason why I made this video. To be honest, there's no. Uh, Nothing more than that, just trying to articulate that point with a little picture. Um, but yeah, I, th I, th I think that's a really important thing to, to reiterate. I don't like to say the same thing over and over again. Um, I'm not like upset or anything, but like obviously like I meet new people, new people follow me on Instagram, new people follow me. You know, the, there's always going to be um, that myth that might get perpetuated, kind of like a disease, right? And if everyone just wasn't infected for like t a certain amount of time, then that pathogen might die off. So in that way, memes, by which I mean, you know, like a social idea or concept, you know, can be destroyed through um, kind of just denying its ability to infect you. So try to do that. It's more of it's sort of like a conceptual infection instead of like a physiological one. But uh, don't allow that to get to you. Uh, I'm going to leave this video up as well. Um, here's another example of the picture before I leave you all with it. But um, yeah, let me go over this one more time. So you've got the spore at the beginning, which created an apressorium.
and then a penetration peg, and then a hostorium. The penetration peg allows it to uh, penetrate into the cell by dissolving the, or enzyma enzymatically dissol dissolving the cutin, the pectin, and the cellulose to get into the cytoplasm, which is this section here. This is the cell wall on the exterior and the cytoplasm in the interior, and that's where the site of nutrient transfer happens, uh, which the, which happens with the hostorium. Then just like a plant that gets nutrients from the soil and then starts to sprout, the spore sprouts. It creates hyphae, which go along the cells and produce more um, hostoria, and more and more cells become infected, which robs nutrients from the plant, but it's a parasite, so that's what it does. And then you have, over time, the, the, uh, the network, not really the spore necessarily, but the network starts to create conidia, which are the fruit-bearing um, fruit, which are the spore-bearing um, reproductive structures. If it was a basidiomycete, and an ascomycete, um, then it would produce a mushroom. So you can think of this as like a really small mushroom that produces the spores, and then those go on to infect other plants, or maybe reinfect the same host at a different location, but not systemically.